the events of 1915 that Raphael Lemkin, the Polish jurist and legal scholar, a Holocaust survivor himself, Raphael Lemkin termed the Armenian Genocide. It was Lemkin who had used the term first in the mid-1940s. In fact, it was Lemkin who, who, who in, indeed was compelled to study what he would come to call genocide because of his engagement with the Armenian atrocities. Um, that this event cast a long shadow over the 20th century. It became the template for all genocide to follow, and it became the first instance of genocide practiced in its modern form. And again, I want to suggest the two reaches of this event, both to the angelic and the demonic poles of the 20th century. In the demonic zone, it's important to note that Adolf Hitler said eight days before invading Poland in 1939, who today, after all, speaks of the annihilation of the Armenians. Hitler was inspired by the fact that what the Turkish government was able to do to the Armenians really in about a year's time, a million people were killed in a year, more were killed in the months following, years following, Hitler was inspired by the fact that the Turkish government had been able to carry out systematic race extermination in a concentrated period of time using the apparatus of bureaucracy, military, and government communications. <clears throat> and these are some of the, the features that define modern genocide and distinguish it from pre-modern genocide. Genocide, of course, has been with us since the beginning of human history, and we have plenty of it in our own national past, uh, given the eradication of Native Americans and African Americans. But Hitler was inspired by what the Turkish government did in 1915, and he was also inspired by the fact that what had been the largest international human rights crisis of the second decade of the 20th century had been pretty much washed down the memory hole only 20 years later. And Hitler's statement reminds us as well, of course, that memory and historical memory is always about a moral dimension. And on the angelic zone of the 20th century, I'm going to circle back to what I mentioned a few minutes ago, the impact of the Armenian genocide on the man who invented the concept of genocide as a crime in international law, Raphael Lemkin, was enormous. It was the massacres of the Armenians and later the Solomon Tellurian trial in Berlin in June of 1920 when a young Armenian boy assassinated the chief architect of the Armenian genocide, Talat Pasha. It was those events that prompted Lemkin to begin to argue with his own law professors at the University of Lvov, asking them why there was no law against a nation state's mass murdering of, of more than a million people. And yet it was a crime if one man murdered another man. And this began Lemkin's whole journey into one of the most important human rights concepts and in the end paradigms of the modern age. And that all is tied up in the in the Armenian Genocide. So we think of the event I'm going to talk to you tonight about as having those reaches into <clears throat> the modern era. We also come to understand that genocide in its modern form was carried out during this moment, this 1915 moment of the new. And it was carried out by the Ottoman Turkish government behind the screen of World War I. And War is often a convenient ambience for the carrying out of systematic race extermination, to use Ambassador Henry Morgenthau's own words. And the Nazis would learn that well, too. And I think the analogy here is, is pertinent and deep, that the Holocaust in some way is to World War II what the Armenian Genocide is to World War I, an instance in which genocide was carried out by a perpetrator behind the screen uh, and within the dimensions of a 
total war. My great uncle will find himself in 1916. Um, and the story there is a very exciting and interesting story. But it's important to say, in the terms of the polyphonic acoustic of this memoir, that their accounts matter a great deal because we have Swiss and Austrian and German testimony. My great uncle is listening to it. And he is also recounting quite extraordinary moments in which Swiss, Austrian, and German engineers risk their lives to intervene to help save Armenian women and children in certain instances, quite dramatic and quite powerful. So I want you to keep that in mind. You're hearing this kind of layering of voices, and I, and I want to emphasize the importance of the German, Swiss, and Austrian engineers in this story. The next point I want to make is that the memoir, I believe, is distinguished in a particular way by the analytical perspective of the author. At certain points, he will absolutely step back from the narrative and begin to analyze history and politics and context. He wants to explain to you the conditions surrounding the plan to annihilate the Armenians that evolved in the year 1914 and the early months of 1915. He wants to explain to you his understanding of Russian-Turkish relations or of European power and Turkish relations. And he's a very good analyzer of Turkish history and of Armenian contemporary affairs. He's very hard on the Armenian community. He doesn't spare his venom or his anger for his sense of how ill-prepared the Armenian community in Turkey was for this explosion. He, he castigates the Armenian cultural and political leaders for their naivete, their innocence, um, their misperceptions. And I think all of this is very important to establishing the uh, critical authority of his voice. You trust him and because of his ecumenical intellectual vision. I would say that he really saw himself as a public intellectual taking on a public intellectual's role as critic.